Clive Sterling, Joseph De Vincenzo, all of you. I'm really grateful to have been uh, invited here, especially grateful to Justice Brennan's daughter Nancy and her daughter uh, in law Georgiana for welcoming me to Newark for this wonderful occasion. And I do want to join uh, all of you in acknowledging Thomas J. Warren uh, for his truly singular sculptural creation. I'm looking forward to actually gazing on it, but I can think of no compliment more fitting uh, than to say that the statue's dignity and refinement almost equal that of its great subject. Speaking about Justice Brennan uh, and this extraordinary tribute to him is really very poignant for me. I'm proud to say that Justice Brennan was my judicial hero, and I'm honored to say that for many years he was my friend. I hope you'll allow me a few minutes just to say why I hold him in such high esteem, and why I think the unveiling of this statue in his honor should serve not only as an occasion to remember the lovable human being that he was, but also as a call to all of us to continue on the path toward justice that he so admirably forged. Justice Brennan wrote more than 1,300 opinions while serving on the US Supreme Court. And through those opinions, he literally transformed the legal landscape in which all of us live. Simply put, he was the primary architect of the system of individual rights that we all take for granted today. Now, to say that he invented the system would have been too much. That wouldn't really have been appropriate anyway for the judicial branch. I think the system was implicit in our Constitution. That was the Constitution's genius. But the system had barely been sketched by generations of framers before William Brennan came to our nation's highest court. He had the unique vision to see the design whole, and he exercised the artistry to build it into an enduring legal scaffold, a living sculpture for the ages. Just think about it. Before Justice Brennan took his seat on the Supreme Court, the government could, could blow its sirens, as it still does. The government could terminate an individual's welfare benefits with no explanation, no opportunity to be heard, just cut you off. That changed with Justice Brennan's landmark opinion in a case called Goldberg v. Kelly which stood for the audacious principle that poor people, too, deserve due process of law. Before Justice Brennan's opinion in 1964, in a case called New York Times versus Sullivan, newspapers across the nation were afraid to report on human rights abuses and on the events surrounding civil disobedience for fear that they would be financially crushed with libel suits which had become a favorite weapon of segregationists in the South. In a decisive victory for the freedoms of speech and press, Justice Brennan's opinion in that case held that you could not successfully challenge a news story without clear proof that it was deliberately or recklessly false. That liberated the New York Times and a lot of other news agencies to report on the illegal activities of public officials who tried desperately to sustain Jim Crow. Justice Brennan's was also the barely visible hand behind the Supreme Court's acknowledgement in a case called Griswold versus Connecticut of a basic constitutional right to privacy, the right that forms the basis of such fundamental freedoms as bodily integrity, including a woman's right to choose. This right to privacy, the right that each of us enjoys to aut autonomy over our bodies and the many basic decisions that govern our personal lives, who we marry, how we lead our lives, is nowhere specifically spelled out in the text of the document that we have as our Constitution. But Justice Brennan rightly understood, and he was the first justice who fully explained that the Constitution's text is much more than a laundry list of rights. He wrote shortly before the Griswold case, the protection of the Bill of Rights goes beyond the specific guarantees that are listed there. It goes beyond those guarantees 
and protects from government abridgment those equally fundamental personal rights that are necessary to make the guarantees fully meaningful. So as you go about your individual lives, what you take for granted is protected in large part because of the man whose statue we are going to be looking at. Now those words about protecting what's fully meaningful were fundamental to Justice Brennan's view that the United States Constitution is the greatest tool we have to protect our fundamental rights and to form the basis for a fair and just society. It is a far more expansive and dynamic view than one that treats the Constitution as a kind of Dead Sea parchment, a merely static proclamation frozen in time against which another former student of mine, the Chief Justice of the United States, once said that we merely judge balls and strikes. To Justice Brennan, the law was not just a command, it was a promise. It was a promise whose true fulfillment is equal justice. That promise consistently informed his many opinions on the court. The many cases in which he managed to get five justices to agree. And he always said the main rule around here is learning how to count to five. His writings for the Supreme Court held that due process of law requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt in all criminal cases. You all know about the presumption of innocence. That's Justice Brennan. It was his opinions that said that public benefits, including unemployment compensation, cannot be made to depend on your sacrifice of constitutional rights. Before those opinions, you could be told, unless you agree to praise the government, we can cut you off welfare. We can cut you off unemployment compensation. That can't happen anymore. It was his fundamental genius that led the court to conclude that judges can properly review political district lines and apportionment formulas that politicians create and preserve to ensure their political survival. The basic core principle of one person, one vote, a principle on behalf of which so many die around the world, is a principle that wasn't a reality in our law before Justice Brennan. Although many of Justice Brennan's stirring dissents were destined to become the law of the land, some of them still echo hauntingly to the present day and leave us with a good deal of unfinished work. Among them was his dissent in McCleskey versus Kemp, a case in which the Supreme Court held by a bare majority that the state of Georgia can continue to impose the death sentence despite overwhelming evidence that it was being consistently applied in a racially discriminatory manner. Unlike five of his colleagues in that case, Justice Brennan was unwilling to view such systemic injustice as inevitable. He said, it is tempting to pretend that minorities on death row share a fate unconnected to our own that our treatment of them sounds no echoes beyond the chambers in which they die. Such an illusion, he said, is ultimately corrosive, for the reverberations of injustice are not easily confined. Justice Brennan was right. The reverberations of injustice are never easily confined, and today they often sound deafening in both our criminal and civil justice systems throughout the country, despite our best efforts. Public defenders' offices are underfunded and overworked. Their annual caseloads can range between 500 and 900 felony cases and over 2,000 misdemeanors, at least five or six times the ceiling set by the National Advisory Commission on Criminal Justice. In 2007, some defenders in New Orleans handled 19,000 cases a year an average of just under seven minutes per case. Imagine getting a defense in seven minutes. The situation is no less dire in civil cases, including those that involve life-altering matters like deportation, loss of child custody, or eviction. To qualify for federally funded legal assistance, you've got to earn no more than 25% above the poverty line. There are around 50 million Americans who qualify by that criterion, 
But over half of those who qualify and seek assistance from the 137 ma major federally funded legal aid assistance programs have to be turned away because levels of funding are so low. And imagine those who don't even go and try because they know they will never get through. The perennial deficiencies in indigent defense and the great gaps in legal services for the poor and for the middle class, ladies and gentlemen, constitute not just a problem in America, they constitute a crisis. And I've been around the world, looked at what's happening elsewhere. Uh, we are by no means at the top of the heap in terms of delivering justice. We're somewhere in the middle. It's been less than three months since President Obama and Attorney General Holder asked me to lead the administration's new initiative in search of justice. It's a search that's at the heart of our national identity, and it embodies aspirations that both the President and the Attorney General have repeatedly articulated, very much in the spirit of Justice Brennan's hundreds of opinions. We certainly have our work cut out for us, something I know it will take all of us, lawyers, judges, labor unions, businesses, big ones and small ones, nonprofit organizations, political leaders, community activists, the Department of Justice, ordinary American citizens, those who have taken the trouble to come out to a celebration like this. It'll take us all to fix the problems in our legal system that seem to many to be insurmountable and in the end to fulfill Martin Luther King's dream that the arc of the moral universe will bend toward justice. That's why I so welcome Chief Justice Rabner's invitation that the federal government work with officials here in Newark to find pilot projects that work, to identify approaches that make a difference without simply spending more money to no end, self-help desks, ways of enabling people to access the many services that they may not even know about. We're working with the Office of Information Technology at the White House in order to create better web-enabled access in supermarkets, in grocery stores, in cafeterias, in medical clinics, in emergency rooms. We need to go where people are in order to make the law user-friendly and not simply an obstacle course. As you know well, Justice Brennan grew up right here in Newark son of an Irish immigrant who shoveled coal at the local brewery. Life was hard and the work was difficult, but Newark was and remains a place where the promise of life and law are lived under the caring and watchful eyes of the whole community. One of the stories that Bill Brennan recounted to his daughter Nancy recalled the time that he fainted as a young teenager on his morning milk route, largely out of sight. A good Samaritan went out of his way into the side lot where Justice Brennan had fallen into a drift and carried him home, despite the fact that the nation was then in the throes of the deadly influenza epidemic that had most people too scared even to approach a stranger. Justice Brennan taught Nancy that this stranger's courageous helping hand was an example of we all have to do to build a better community. The monument that we will unveil here today is a reminder. It's a silent memento of Justice Brennan's vision of the world. It's a world in which all of us, regardless of race or religion or class, wealth or gender or sexual orientation, regardless of whether we or our mothers or fathers are immigrants, can gain equal access to justice. That lofty sentiment formed the very stuff of Justice Brennan's life work, including the 35 years that he served on the Supreme Court. In the words of the writer Robert Pogue Harrison, he is lending us his eyes. This stunning likeness of Justice Brennan will come to life only if we do more than just remember the great work that he did in his lifetime. It will come to life if we look through his eyes to the guardian angels of our better nature, a nature that can see the invisible, hear the inaudible, 
and touch the spirit of our past, our present, and our future. Thank you all so much. Well, we should give them a standing round of applause and ovation, please. Thank you for taking that. He's truly one of America's great scholars. Uh, before I leave the podium, I want to express a, a, a thank you to another branch of government that's here in full support of the statuary today. I've seen our assignment judge, Judge Costello, presiding judge Sybil. Oh, that's right, Cody, Judge Cody, uh, from Chancery, Judge Levy, and the rest of you all. We really appreciate your support. Judge Vasquez, do I have to name everyone? Lombardi, etc. cetera. Um, now's my time to leave and my time to express my thank you to Guy Sterling and my thank you to Joe DiVincenzo. I said it before and I can't say it enough, without Joe's drive, without Joe's diligence, things like this would not be possible. As you walk past this complex, the dignity that he has brought to Essex County and to Newark is unparalleled. From the new park, from the Veterans Courthouse, from the appellate division that Justice Rabner was mentioning before, and now to this great monument, which is long overdue. Uh, I was called upon once before to help Joe with the 9-11 monument up at Eagle Rock Avenue, and I urge you all to go there. It's a testament to a horrific event, but something that we should not forget. And now he touched me again, and I, and I served with great pleasure and dignity. And I tell you right now, sir, I'm ready to serve again. When you call, I'll be there. And I do that publicly so that when I call all these fine people with their checkbooks, they know that uh, we mean business. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Joe. And now, without further ado, Joseph DiVincenzo, our great county executive. Thank you all very much. I know it's been a long program, but today Essex County, no question, is making history. You know, to follow Frank John Tomasi is one thing, but to follow Lawrence Tribe is another thing. Thinking about somebody who went to Barringer High School and following somebody in his footsteps, speaking after him, it's really a tough act to follow. But on behalf of Chief Justice Stu Rabner, on behalf of Governor Byrne, Mayor Cory Booker, our President Blonnie Watson, our Vice President, uh, Ralph Computer, an entire freehold board. We want to thank you, Lawrence Tribe, for being here and make uh, for this occasion. It, it was really great, and it was a great speech. Thank you very much. You know, there's no question, Chief Justice Stuart Robert knows, this is the best courthouse complex in the state of New Jersey. All right? And it's because you have an administration, you have a freeholder board working together along with our other constitutional officers. Meaning the sheriff on tour. I want to thank the sheriff and the, all the sheriff's officers here for providing the security each and every day and making this county what it is today. Thank you, sheriff. Our prosecutor, Bob Lorino. Thank you, Bob, for being part of our great team here and your staff. Our assignment judge, Costello. You know, this happened in the short eight years that we were able to turn this entire complex around. And it's only because you have an administration, you have a freehold of work working together with the judicial system. That has never happened ever since there's been a county exec form ever in 78. We work together as a team, and the reason that this complex looks like it looks like is because we come together for the people of Essex County, all 22 municipalities, all 800,000 residents. This is a place where we should all feel proud of. We've made great strides and we're going to continue to make strides here because we want to make sure that people in Essex County know that this is a safe and friendly place, but also we want the people throughout the state of New Jersey to know that. So Chief Justice, we want to make you continue to make you proud. To my friend Guy Sterling, you know, we all know what Chief Justice Brennan has done, okay, and his record speaks for itself, but will put me over the hump was two things. One, he's from Newark, and number two, he attended Barringer High School, just like Congressman Rodino, Congressman Payne, Steve Adabow, I'm sure many of you have done that, but that put it over the top, because to me, politics is all local, and this is long overdue, and we should have done this years ago, but thanks to Guy Sterling, this made it happen, and thanks to Frank John Tomasi and the entire committee for raising the dollars to put this, put this together for this statue. To Dan Silvanti and his park staff, I want to thank him for organizing this event. To Joyce, Anthony, Lauren, and Teresa Ruiz for really putting together a great program. Today has been a great day. Now at this time, I'd like to pull Guy Sterling forward. Guy, come here. Nancy, 
could you come forward over here, please? Guy? We want to present these flowers to, to Nancy, the daughter of William Brennan, but also to the entire Brennan family. I know there's other family members here. This is a great day, not only for your family, but it's a great day for Essex County. It's a great day for the state. And uh, we are just so proud of this. And to be able to get a magic government to get this done in 10 months, it speaks for itself. And we're just so proud of uh, you, Nancy, and, and your father will be on our footsteps forever. Governor, Mayor Booker, two of the most admired civil servants in uh, New Jersey's history, thank you so much. And, and the tireless and committed county executive, you're extraordinary, Joe. Thank you so very much. I want to say that my father, who played football at Barringer High, talked about his time at Barringer a lot. But if he had known um, that the Harriet Tubman uh, school was going to perform here, he would have been equally touched. And from my family's heart, thank you both so much, both of the schools, for being here. And I just want to know how you knew uh, that the uh, canon in D was one of his favorite pieces. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to celebrate the teachers and the soloists for that beautiful performance as well. I'm really just here as the spokesperson for a very proud family. Not only is Newark the home of William Joseph Brennan, Jr., but also of William Joseph Brennan and the family of my grandfather, who was here as public safety commissioner in Newark. We're here, and I wonder if you all would stand up and let us celebrate you. Jersey is uh, our family, and even though some of us may have moved elsewhere, we couldn't be more touched by today. I was driving down from my house in New England, thinking about today and recognizing that there is something in the human spirit that wants to recognize and thank people who have made a difference, and we do that by taking the names of civic avenues, like the Martin Luther King Boulevard. We do it by Arlington National Cemetery. We do it by precious uh, places in every state. We do it by statues. But there is a difference about today, at least for me. Sometimes the, either the power or the influence means that a statue is mandatory, uh, that presidential libraries must be built, that statues must be erected. It's part of the way we lead our civic life. And there are other times that individuals decide that from the heart there is a person that they want to remember because the inspiration of that person deserves a statue. So it's a private impulse not a mandatory civic act. And Guy Sterling and Frank and Joe were the people who took on that personal impulse that has brought us all here together today to recognize my father's legacy, but also what he stood up for. And I just want to thank them so much for the family. times that we, as listening to Professor Tribe and listening to Mayor Booker, 
think about how people like my father took the best of what Newark had to offer and all those mentors who cared about him as a young man and influenced him to keep going. Those are some of the reasons why we honor him with this statue today. But I'd also like to say while statues are probably in the human DNA, the real importance is to, if one admires someone, then act like them. If you admire someone whose kindness and gentleness, whose respect for other people's points of view, whose value of human dignity, if those are the reasons you admire my father as a man, act like him. Act like him on a daily basis. The kindness of strangers are, is part of the civic life we're trying to build for a better future. And if your work happens to be in leading a city, in leading a state, in leading a nation, in being a practitioner of the law, and you want to stand up for access to the vote so that every part of our system has your name on it, if you want to be part of making sure that access to justice is a value that is present for every American, then that's the reason to celebrate my father today and to celebrate you. Thank you so much for the Brennan family. Thank you very much. Before we unveil, I just have to thank also Phil Levesque, our Director of Public Works, who helped us with the monument. And I also want to thank James Mooney, who came up here and sang the Irish National Anthem. And also Mark Beckett. Thank you, Mark. And also to the postal thing. Now we're going to unveil it. If the uh, freeholders could please come up here. All right. And everybody on the day is joining us here. And also the Brennan family, please come forward. Jay, Jay Warren. 
say the eyes are the windows of the soul, you capture the eyes. You capture the eyes, man. I told you, what did I tell you? We're going to get it done, right? Can you open this up, please, folks? Yeah. 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 